Hello, everyone. I am pleased to invite our renowned faculty from America for the this session on the CME, International CME on Acute Coronary Syndrome. And uh, introductory comments from me, let me share the screen. Uh, When, it, when we talk of acute coronary syndrome, we need to have a look at the what is the preponderance and significance of acute coronary syndrome in the community. 48% of all cardiac deaths are due to acute coronary syndrome. And the, that's why it's very important to understand the whole mechanism and to to develop a situation where we can educate the people also to understand this whole scenario, which is very dangerous. In America, 1.57 million people every day, every year, every year get admitted with ACS. Out of that, 1.24 million are either you know, an unstable angina or an STEMI, and 0.33 million with STEMI. When it comes to India figure, we have a projected figure extrapolated from the Kerala state. And uh, we have almost 30 lakh MI STEMI in, in one year, 30 lakh, which is almost 10 times. Whereas the population difference is 3.5 times. India, uh, America's population is 3.5 times less. And we have 30 lakh cases per year of STEMI. So it comes to, if we extrapolate to this uh, overall acute coronary syndrome, then it comes to 15.7 million cases in India uh, and maybe 15, 12.4 million of them are in STEMI. So it's a huge burden, socioeconomic burden on the country. The main cause for the, uh, for the acute coronary syndrome is development of the atherosclerosis with the age. And so many other factors. Of course, we have multifactorialities and um, some of the uh, factors like LDL is incriminated to the maximum level. Now we have a situation, either it can cause a plaque and can cause a stable narrowing or it can ca cause a platelet aggregation on the plaque and produce unstable angina or it can cause a non-occlusive thrombotic lesion and produce noyan STEMI and, or a completely occlusive thrombotic lesion and produce STEMI. So this is basically a, a, the full spectrum of the atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. On the other side, atherosclerosis, one side can produce plaque and narrowing and other side it can produce the ectasia or aneurysm. And if you see the overall angiogram, 1.5 to 8% of angiogram will have ectasia. Whereas uh, the, uh, the multiple cell disease and other things will be almost 50%. In the unstable angina presentation is non-occlusive thrombus, specific, no specific changes, normal enzymes. El enzymes slightly elevated, no ST elevation, only ST depression in NSTEMI an ST elevation MI or LBBB, new LBBB in STEMI. Now, important thing to understand is the time after the onset of the chest pain to balloon to our uh, so door to balloon, needle time and door to balloon time, both are very important. Uh, and as you go forward and after 12 hours, no benefit as such. Six to 12 hours, there is potential in fact healing benefit, but the maximum benefit is within one hour or 30 minutes. Our golden time, what we call is 90 minutes. Door to middle time is 30 minutes. That is thrombolysis time. As early as possible, patient should be thrombolyzed. If he reaches the non-PCI capable center, 
But if he has a access to cap PCI capable center, then 90 minutes is the door to balloon time. That is when we can have maximum benefit in terms of mortality and overall survival. So this is something which is very important. And and STEMI uh, present, uh, STEMI will present as ST elevation and elevation and increase increase in the troponin I and T uh, levels. Similarly, as in the NSTEMI, we will see as minor ST changes and you know proximal LED critical lesion. Two millimeter deep T wave inversion is good enough to guide us that this could be a valence syndrome where it, disease, you know, if it get occluded can lead to uh, what you call widow make us syndrome. So this is the picture that we have. And we need to, when you have an time, we need to calculate the risk to decide whether invasive strategy or a, a differing, differ invasive strategy will work with or invasive strategy within 24 hours or before discharge index of the index admission. Then there is a gray score, and uh, how this has come to uh, know, come to a knowledge that when we did a Timax Dr. study, Doctor Bank, where, hello, we're unable to see your slides, sir. You are unable to see my slides. Yes, sir. We can you see, see my slide now? No. No. Please share screen again. No, share the screen again. Okay. Let me try. I don't see a taskbar here. Taskbar is missing. And now I got the taskbar. Sorry to see that. Anyway, now, uh, so what I was saying is uh, now since I can't see my slides, I might as well talk without the slide. And uh, uh, the, I don't know what has exactly happened, but uh, let me come, uh, let me uh, conclude on, about my talk that either if it is STEMI, Either we have a 30 minute door to needle time to benefit the patient maximum with thrombolysis. If it is STEMI with the PCI capable center within 90 minutes golden time, we should go have a pump. In NSTEMI, we look at the gray score or TIMI score. If they are high enough, then catch uh, the patient within 24 hours. Median time is 14 hours. If this is not available for some reason, PCI capable center, then treat this patient medically and transfer them to PCI medical center, uh, PCI capable center. So this is how we, we can look at the whole thing. Now, may I invite the next speaker? Uh, the first speaker was uh, Dagobeti, Dr. Dagobeti, but he is not available. He will come a little late. He has an emergency to do. So we, I'm inviting Dr. Parvez Miraj to talk on his topic. Dr. Parvez Miraj is a, the Chief CTO of Director at the North Health Health in New York, America. And he's going to enlighten us on LTV management in STEMI, that is large thrombus burden management in STEMI. This particular class has a 90% mortality if not treated properly. So that's why it is very important that we understand how to treat large thrombus pattern in STEM. Parvej, may I invite you to? Dr. Miraj, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, no, yes. Perfect. 
Well, thank you very much for the invitation and to my esteemed panelists. It's a privilege to be here and those who are listening uh, in India, thank you for joining us. I think it's only appropriate that we start with a case and I'll start with this case, which is a, uh, an exaggerated example of what I would consider to be extremely large thrombus burden um, and potentially even an embolic distal embolization of a large you know, plug of thrombus in the RCA, as you can see here that travel down to the distal bifurcation. Uh, and you can see here the final result is it look pretty good at the end. And so the question becomes is how do you get from the left screen to the right screen? And so we have a lot of options and these options exist. We'll go through a couple of options. Or one is the use of intracoronary lytics, the use of intracoronary glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitors, use of vasodilators, the use of thrombectomy catheters where you actually manually or mechanically aspirate thrombus or you just say, you know what, I'm never gonna get this out. Well, let's just call it a day and let's hope that time just gets rid of this thrombus. So just to review very quickly, uh, my, former, my, 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 my teacher and, and, and former mentor, Dr. Gibson, came up with this thrombus classification, grade zero, one, two, three, four, and five. And as you can see here, really grade zero is no thrombus present and grade five is unable to assess the thrombus burden because the vessel is totally occluded. And that very commonly happens in, in many of our STEMI cases where you're unable to really assess the thrombus, the actual vessel because the thrombus is completely occlusive of the distal vessel. Uh, how, this particular thrombus probably falls in the category of four uh, because it's very much almost the same size as the vessel. However, there was some contrast flow around that thrombus. So the solution, is it really thrombectomy? So for years, that's what we were thinking. Simple thrombectomy, use an aspiration catheter, pull out the, put some suction with a, with a syringe at the back end of it, and you're able to uh, remove the thrombus. How about mechanical thrombectomy? Well, prior to the manual aspiration catheters, uh, many folks were using before my time uh, the manu the the uh, realytic or angiojet thrombectomy catheters, all of which fell out of favor after the AMI trial. But we'll talk about more of this. And then obviously the use of drugs, tb 3 inhibitors, and lytics. And I think this is very important to have that conversation. So clinical trials with manual aspiration, as we know, are utilized in the following trials: TAPIS, TASTE, and TOTAL. TAPIS was the original trial, as you can see here which really showed the mortality benefit of thrombus aspiration as compared to conventional PCI out to almost uh, over a year. And you can see here that uh, the clear, there was a clear benefit in this particular trial to thrombectomy catheters. And this is what really launched the use of thrombectomy catheters uh, uh, more ubiquitously. The A study, uh, slightly different outcome. As you can see here, they're all cause mortality at 30 days, which is really where we're looking at the mortality and the benefit and the difference of thrombectomy and the acute phase and the acute setting of the, of the, of the patient's uh, MI. You can see here that PCI plus thrombectomy versus PCI, albeit there was a decrease in all-cause uh, all death, there was really no significant difference. And you can see here that the effect of thrombectomy at one year, there was a large effect size in, in the TAPIS trial, but really no difference in taste. And the taste trial was about seven times larger than TAPAS. It was also not a single center trial. Uh, and so therefore, you know, many people have really fallen out of favor for routine thrombectomy. And as in the United States guidelines, especially it's been taken away as a class one indication. If you look here, the primary outcome to cardiovascular death, MI shock or heart failure at one year, PCI alone versus thrombectomy, you can see really the curves completely joined. It looks like one curve. So really no difference between the two. And the one harm potential that they that was discussed in the total trial was that there may be a risk of, of strokes, albeit clinically, most of us who, who perform these procedures have really, honestly, I've never seen one. Uh, it doesn't mean it can't happen. Uh, however, and, and in the particular study, obviously, they were looking at it more closely. Uh, PCI alone versus thrombectomy, the stroke rate was almost double. Um, and you can see here that there was a very significant difference of strokes if you used thrombectomy catheters versus you didn't, which is really the reason why it became a class three recommendation for routine use of thrombectomy fast manual aspiration thrombectomy in the U.S. Uh, guidelines. So these were the clinical trials, TAPAS, TASTE, and TOTAL, as you can see here. Uh, these are the, the summaries. And, and really, at today, uh, we would normally say that traditional, typical, routine use of manual aspiration thrombectomy has really fallen out of favor due to the lack of benefit with the potential risk of harm. And I think that's the best way to describe it. There's only one study that really showed some benefit, and that one study is really standing alone. So how about in thrombus aspiration in high thrombus burden patients? That's really what we're looking at here. So there may be potential for, for, for more uh, definitive thrombus aspiration in this particular subgroup. This was not specifically studied in just high thrombus burden or large thrombus burden. And if you look at this 
uh, multi uh, meta analysis uh, that was done by Dr. Pod and others, you can see here that you know aspiration thrombectomy is not associated with any clinical benefit, and and you can see here that the concomitant administration of two B three inhibitors did not really influence uh, potential benefits as well. Um, so this is really an interesting interesting uh, con uh, consensus for both thrombectomy and the use of two B three inhibitors. And if you look at the routine use of thrombectomy in this particular meta-analysis, you can see here pretty much across the board that all the trials pretty much cross the, the unity line. So really no benefit across the board. And if you look at stroke, there was a slight direction towards more strokes, but I would say that the overall picture because of the statistics don't really pan out. So as we said, in the ACC guidelines, you can see the usefulness of selective and bailout aspiration still exists in, in, in selected cases. And I think this is a very important point that we should, we should remember that in, in selective cases, this is a very useful technique. However, routine use is not really recommended. There are some new aspiration devices out there, which I, 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 uh, I just I felt like it was important to discuss. The Penumbra device, which is a aspiration catheter that's actually sort of not mechanical, but it is a suction, continuous vacuum suction uh, pump. Uh, it, it's I got a nice, nice stiff catheter, and it actually works very well. Uh, there really is no data out for this yet, so we really don't know whether this is any better than the other devices. However, from a, from an anecdotal standpoint, this does seem to work pretty well. Uh, there's actually a function control switch, so you're able to actually turn on and off the device uh, at your fingertips. And you'll see here, this is exactly how the catheter looks as it goes down in our particular case. And so you can see here that is also the old school uh, rheolytic thrombectomy uh, catheter, as you can see here, and that this actually mechanically was supposed to break up the uh, thrombus. It's been used in obviously the periphery and other areas uh, very successfully. Uh, when, it was when it was attempted to be used in the coronary bed, however, unfortunately due to the AMI trial, you can see here that uh, there really was no significant benefit versus angiogen versus control in terms of ST res segment resolution on the contrary, actually it was worse. Uh, and, and the infarct size reduction really wasn't that much better either. And if you look at this, and this is really where the where where the uh, it fell out of favor, as you can see here, the difference between death and MACE, overall MACE events was very significantly uh, not in AngioJet's favor, and this really just took AngioJet out of the picture and equation in terms of the uh, utilizing it in thrombus burden. Some folks have also used laser catheters, ectomer laser catheters. It's a it's a it's an ectomer laser energy. It's absorbed by the thrombus. It, it sort of liquefies the thrombus burden and ablates the underlying plaque. And uh, in, in doing so, there may be some inhibition of also platelet aggregation in this process. It has not really been looked at specifically in, in any kind of randomized fashion for, for large thrombus burden or thrombus burden in general in STEMIs. However, it is something that is used uh, uh, selectively. And it's something that's interesting that I think future trials may be interesting in this particular space. The Carmel registry was really the only registry trial, no randomized trial that looked at this. And you can see here that there was very good success rate with good TIMI, three, good, good TIMI flow resolution uh, with minimal complication risk. Um, and so it has potential, but we don't have any randomized data to looking at looking at this. Local intralesional 2P3 inhibitors obviously have been looked at in conceptually and scientifically rationale. It was the infused AMI trial that really, performed, that really provided the supporting data with the use of Direct, specifically local intralesional, not through the guide, uh, dis, uh, uh, dispersion of the GP3 inhibitor in the actual vessel. Um, the IDA trial disputes some of the benefits of the approach, and maybe there's another strategy. So if you look here, that you can see here that in the guidelines, it's still, it's still pretty much a 2A level of evidence across the board for all the different 2B3 inhibitors uh, in the use of, in, in, in the setting of STEMI. And I had done a Twitter poll to see how many pay, how many folks out on Twitter actually use 2B3 inhibitors. And you can see here, they're pretty much across the board, I'd say it was less than 10% or less. Uh, so it was uh, the majority of folks are not even uh, not using it. And I think that's pretty much the, uh, the routine. The infused AMI trial, like I said, uses a specific catheter called a Clearway catheter uh, to actually uh, uh, deliver the de deliver the drug and an export catheter to remove thrombus. It was a two by two design trial, and uh, that's just the local delivery of the of the drug, which I think is an important piece of information. If you look at the outcomes of the trial, you can see here that you know uh, infarct size. Uh, if you look at uh, epsiximab versus no epsiximab versus aspiration versus no aspiration, really the aspiration arm didn't really show any benefit, but the epsiximab arm did show some benefit. Uh, so really, it was more the two B three inhibitor that actually improved uh, the outcomes. If you look at the different outcome events here, and uh, not to belabor the point, but you can see here clearly that there was definitely a benefit in the in the infarct size reduction 
uh, in both the use of uh, 2BD3 inhibitors in these two outcomes. One year death also uh, better uh, in those patients who received any treatment versus no treatment. And I think that's an important piece of information. So I think this is a uh, using epifibotide and dose strategy and undergoing PCI. You can see here that uh, they were treated with a bolus infusion. Uh, that was decided because it was de determined whether that a bolus only infusion of uh, epifibotide reduced was potentially reducing bleeding, reducing the need for transfusion. But unfortunately, there was really no difference in mortality or MI rates. So I think that, you know, this is just another thing that we, we use as a bailout technique in, in patients who have large thrombus burden and those who we don't get a great outcome on its own. And I think this is a good discussion. Uh, I think that this is where, this is this sentence, I think is a key sentence from this particular paper looking at, you know, you really want to minimize bleeding in those patients by shortening the 2B3 infusion time, dose adjustments of heparin and 2B3As, careful access site management, use of transradial approach, smaller sheaths, and identification of high bleeding risk patients. Essentially, to summarize that statement, use it selectively and be very careful in the patients that you use it in. And in the right patient, it could be proven to be very useful. Um, and I think that, you know, don't use it in high bleeding risk patients and really to reduce the risk of bleeding, this is the summary. So in conclusion, thrombectomy may not work. And really, unfortunately, we have two large trials that pretty much show no clinical significant difference between the two. With selective use in the right patient population, such as this particular topic of large thrombus burden, as the case I showed you originally, I think it is very reasonable and very appropriate to do it in that particular scenario. The goal is to reduce distal embolization and to preserve TIMI3 flow and, and, a, and a good blush score in that, in that STEMI that we're, we're performing. Uh, that is the outcome because of those patients who do not have a good TIMI, who do not have TIMI3 flow at the end of the case and do not have a good blush score at the end of the case, their outcomes are very poor in, in general. And obviously laser can be useful in certain cases, but not routinely. So sort of an overview of, of the different options we have in large thrombus burden. Uh, there is no one size fits all. There is no cookie cutter approach to this. I think it's very important that we selectively look at both the patient and the angiogram and collectively decide what the best approach to these patients will be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Parvecha. It was an excellent talk, and you covered virtually everything. And we'll take questions and answer at the end. May I, I think I see Ramesh come in the picture now. So let's invite Ramesh uh, to, so that, you know, Ramesh, uh, Dr. Ramesh Dagobeti is a renowned uh, interventional cardiologist from America. He's Associate Chief of Cardiology at uh, 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 at, uh, at, at, at the Virgin, West Virginia University. And uh, may I invite uh, Parvesh uh, uh, Dagobiti to kindly come forward and deliver his talk on uh, ACS in coronary ectasia. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Bang. And uh, guys, great to see Dr. Jahar and uh, Parvez and Prashant and the uh, on the line, and then did you notice uh, Rajiv? I addressed you by your first, uh, last name. I also like the fact that you have wearing glasses today. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think you can see my screen now, right? Yeah, yeah. We can see your screen slide, and we can see you also. Okay. Thank you very much. So I, I'll show you a patient of ours. I think uh, you know, more than uh, I'll describe it to you. I don't have any disclosures on this uh, pa presentation. Uh, this is an 18-year-old uh, young kid uh, who comes into the hospital with uh, chest pain and uh, ruled in for non-ST elevation MI, and he was taken to the cath lab. And you see here, these are more than ectasia, and uh, show you giant aneurysm in the left main. Uh, so, uh, you know, how do you approach this patient, actually? So that you can see that the LAD is, miss, uh, is uh, uh, missing in the proximal portion and it fills actually retrograde uh, from uh, uh, the circumflex collaterals and also probably a little bit from the right. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, a degree much higher than ectasia as well. Again, aneurysms, and you can see that the uh, only part that is free of disease is the right PDA. And on the same screen, you can see that the patient uh, uh, you know, that the coronary aneurysm on the left side is heavily calcified as well. So this uh, sort of uh, disease, I don't think you, uh, it's obviously Kawasaki disease, known patient of Kawasaki. And uh, whenever you see such giant aneurysms coming to you, uh, you, you don't have to uh, even 
guess that it is not, uh, uh, it's anything else other than KD. So this patient, as you see on the right side of the screen, he had underwent a bypass surgery appropriately. And there's uh, some discussion here. Uh, he had a lemur to LAD and a free rema that was attached uh, from uh, LAD to, uh, to actually the right TDA. So uh, this uh, happened in uh, March. Uh, he went home. He comes back again in uh, April. And uh, this is what we see on the left hand of the screen, presented with non-ST elevation MI. He was taken to the cath lab. There was a complete occlusion of the uh, left main, uh, and distal left main. Uh, so in my opinion, if I think uh, now, as we know, and I actually uh, would say, uh, don't go after these. Uh, it's a simple, I can end my, uh, my presentation saying that the large ectatic uh, vessels, there's always a huge problem. And uh, so uh, we went after it, uh, opened it uh, the balloon, established the flow, and uh, he comes back again in uh, June uh, with again occlusion uh, uh, of the left main in the distal portion. My partner went back again and tried to open it up and with uh, ballooning it. And because the circumflex was not bypassed and, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, ballooned the osteo uh, part of the circumflex and uh, LAD and uh, able to establish uh, flow. Uh, one minute. Okay, somehow my slides are stuck. Uh, give me, give it a minute. So we established the flow back in this patient, and uh, it still did not, uh, uh, did not, did not actually uh, 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 work, and he still had occlusions in the left main artery. And uh, um, back in again on June seventh, he came back, and uh, we had the same problem. You can, you can still see my slides, right? So. Um, the pathogenesis here is a more of a destruction and weakening of the media layer, and there's chronic over stimulation with endogenous nitric oxide, and uh, ulceration and remodeling consists with advanced uh, atherosclerosis, and the direct effect of uh, elevated inflammatory mediators such as uh, uh, MMP uh, happens in these people with uh, ecstatic and uh, uh, aneurysm. So etiology sort of ectasia is most common. It is atherosclerosis, and uh, you know they also might have a AAA to make sure that uh, you do a abdominal ultrasound or a CT scan to detect that, and especially in people who are more than fifty and smokers. And uh, various vasculitis uh, can be presenting with ectasia, such as Kawasaki, as in my patient, polyarthritis nodus or Takayasu's, and uh, connective tissue disorders such as ehlers danlos Syndrome and sometimes uh, sepsis. And I used to see this actually in our uh, 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 country, India, where I think uh, whether it was, I'm, I blame Cydex because I don't know what else to blame. I think uh, any reusing of uh, wires or balloons and uh, uh, I, I think uh, well, not properly sterilized and uh, or maybe it's just a chemical reaction from the Cydex. I think it actually leads to uh, aneurysms and recently, I have not seen any of them, and uh, even in India, but in the past, uh, at multiple presentations, I was like really amazed to look at these aneurysms. And the trauma and, and cocaine use is also a higher uh, uh, incidence of causing ectasia and uh, aneurysms. Clinical presentation could be anywhere from incidental finding our uh, acute coronary syndrome, as in my patient, and or actually they might have uh, uh, arrhythmias, aneurysm ruptures, which is really rare, and it is more than uh, the uh, more than uh, uh, four centimeters, I think you should uh, uh, really think of, sorry, more than five millimeters, you should start thinking about the risk of rupture. And SVC syndrome can happen because of compression of these aneurysms as well. So the classification, small is more uh, less than five millimeters, medium is uh, five to eight millimeters, or giant is more than eight millimeters. In our patient, it's probably almost like 11 millimeters or so. And there is little evidence that there is a relationship between increased mortality risk and aneurysm size. And uh, uh, morphology is a use of usually fusiform or saccular in shape and the presence of concomitant stenosis. In ectasia, you always remember if it is a small, uh, less than five millimeters, I think it is a pre-stenotic dilatation. So those are not ectatic vessels or sometimes they also have post-stenotic dilatation. 
Why some people have these versus others, I think is all uh, not very clear. And uh, as we said that uh, there's several uh, 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 markers that inflammation, inflammatory markers play a role in these patients. And uh, there's a different, uh, uh, several classifications of these uh, ectasia uh, as the marker system classification uh, described by, obviously by markers. And the diagnosis is a coronary angiogram or multi-slice CT. Obviously, I think in a non stemi and acute coronary syndrome, I'll go for a coronary angiogram. And uh, it could be misleading, and uh, there may be a risk of uh, uh, disrupting the clots uh, with the, even the, with the catheters. And, uh, you know, and you might be having a difficult problem to look at uh, the coronary arteries clearly. So sometimes in these patients, uh, the non-invasive methods might be better, multi-slice CT, can differentiate a true aneurysm from a dissection leading to a fault aneurysm. And it definitely assists in surgical planning as has been done in our patient as well. Cardiac MRI has been described in a patient with known Kawasaki disease who present in thrombosed aneurysm presenting as an MI. And this is mainly to understand whether there's any uh, region that actually you should go after. For example, in our patient, we did a coronary uh, cardiac MRI. It showed actually completely infarcted uh, 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 the circumflex territory with a EF of about 30, 35%, which, uh, so we did not go after that uh, anymore. And uh, OCT or IVUS, uh, although both modalities have been described in identifying spontaneous coronary artery dissection, and uh, in, in these people with ectasia, some of them might have, and OCT's higher spatial resolution allows for more accurate and sensitive detection of uh, the dissection planes uh, as well. So the management, only few studies have thoroughly examined the natural history of coronary ectasia or aneurysms, uh, which has made the management of these lesions controversial. Warfarin has been all strongly recommended in Kawasaki disease with uh, giant uh, ectasia or aneurysms. And uh, you know, I think uh, you know, many of us advocate for long-term warfarin therapy. And the DOACs are being used uh, now recently, but there is no clear data uh, or randomized trial with the use of DOACs. So the natural history, as you see in the ectatic vessels or the non-ectatic vessels in about 130 patients with ectasia, uh, there's a diffuse uh, stenosis uh, uh, and, uh, and the stenotic, uh, uh, diffuse ectasia is seen in the stenosis uh, segments. And the majority of them happen to be right coronary artery and uh, some uh, circumflex and very rarely LAD. But as you can see in the Kawasaki disease, that may not hold uh, true. Uh, it might uh, be even in the uh, left main, as I've shown you as well here. So uh, in the non-ectatic segment, uh, stenosis is seen mostly in the LAD territory as well. So in, in people, uh, in, uh, the risk factors and outcomes in patients with coronary artery an aneurysms, people with and without coronary artery disease, there is definitely no dif uh, huge difference in the Kaplan-Meier uh, curve of uh, survival of, uh, 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 of uh, the coronary artery disease distribution at five years. So subgroup analysis from the CAS uh, registry showed that uh, a similar survival in patients who had undergone bypass surgery was with medical therapy in both aneurysms and stenosis and only groups. The best recommendation to date is intervention only in patients with high-risk features of myocardial compromise, uh, such as in our patient who had been coming with uh, recurrent uh, acute coronary syndrome. And uh, in the non-urgent care patients, those in whom aneurysms are found incidentally or asymptomatic ectasia, uh, reass uh, just uh, reassuring with ECG and have a negative cardiac enzyme investigations, I think we should be uh, we shouldn't proceed any further. Just reassure the patient, and uh, some advocate a prospective follow-up, a yearly CT scan, which I don't I, I actually strongly recommend. Uh, it increases radiation. Patients who require urgent care, the, especially in acute coronary syndromes and uh, rising cardiac enzymes, I think those are the patients who you should uh, do something about it quickly. And then, like in our patient, we actually gave uh, the patient IV heparin and in fact, a 2B3A. And uh, then uh, he went for surgery uh, uh, following actually, which he received uh, 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 DOAX uh, uh, five milligrams twice a day of uh, Eliquis, uh, as well as aspirin and Plavix for about uh, three months. And then uh, only uh, Plavix and Eliquis were continued. These microemboli this uh, happen, and I think we try to do more harm by doing a PCI as we have done in our patient. So I strongly recommend that uh, percutaneous methods have to be uh, very uh, minimal and uh, try to not do them in case of the large aneurysms where the wires are probably mucking up much more than uh, what we want to do uh, in, uh, in, uh, in these patients. 
So uh, then the question about uh, uh, giant countering aneurysm, whether we should ligate or not, is also a question that uh, most people have uh, uh, during surgery. Uh, and I think uh, probably uh, the surgeons uh, are uh, uh, not agreeable for ligation as in our patient, but I probably would discuss much further to say, uh, ask them to ligate and uh, bypass uh, all the vessels that could be done. So to save the myocardium from uh, embolization of the clots from the ectatic segments. So giant coronary aneurysms are uncommon malformations that can occur in a variety of disease states, but are usually due to atherosclerosis. And the definitive uh, diagnosis with invasive angiography may be difficult. And CT angiography provides a better assessment and unstable patients should be treated. Bypass, I think, is much higher than our PCI because if you think about it, uh, you can. I placed a six millimeter stent in the left main one time, but uh, you know, if it is larger than eight millimeters, what are we going to do? We are going to put, take the biliary stents and uh, peripheral stents and place them. Uh, but uh, you know, as as you saw in my patient, I don't think there could be a stent that could cover left main and the LAD because of the discrepancy. You know, so. Uh, you, you'll be stuck, uh, or the circumflex, I mean, you will be stuck you know, because circumflex is three millimeters and osteo left main will be like a 15 millimeters. So the stable patient should probably manage conservatively and Coumadin should be, or uh, Doax should be advocated. The difficult management decisions are due to the presence of concomitant stenosis, as I mentioned. And uh, uh, from a surgical perspective, the pertinent questions, as I said, that whether should be and the proximal vessel should be ligated, whether the aneurysm should be excised or plicated, and whether the thrombus uh, should be removed. All these are questions, I think, but um, uh, I know most of our surgery, we had a long discussion with six of them, and they felt that it is best to leave alone. And uh, I'm not actually 100% sure about that now. You know, So this patient did suffer uh, uh, recurrent uh, um, infarctions in the circumflex territory. So thank you very much. I'll stop sharing the screen now, and I'll be able to answer any questions that we have. Excellent, excellent presentation. In fact, literature says zero, uh, zero cases of left main aneurysm, and you showed the first case, perhaps. Yeah. Excellent presentation, really. And Thank we'll you. take question and answer at the end. And I invite now the next speaker, Dr. Rajiv Johar. He's the chief of cardiology at Northwell Health in New York, USA. And he will enlighten us on... Uh, uh, culprit versus multivessel angioplasty in STEMI. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Of okay, course. Perfect. Sorry. Um, yeah, Ramesh, that was a scary uh, angiogram you showed. And yeah. I think the most important thing to say is try not to wire those things. Um, I, I unfortunately made a mistake trying to wire one a, a few times and uh, they're extremely difficult. It's very hard to find the neck and causing downstream uh, embolization and, and, and problems are, is very, very high. Um, so my, my job is really um, to, to talk about complete revascularization in, in STEMI patients and whether that is the uh, new paradigm versus uh, just infarct related arteries. What I'm gonna talk more about is a common sense approach uh, in doing the right thing for the right patient with physiologic data. Uh, so what lesions are significant and what are not? And that's really the most important question. You know, There's a hyperadrenergic state and we know that the 70% right coronary lesion when you have a circumflex infarct that you bring back the next day is really not 70% and is really a, a, a spasm and is down to 20%. And so what is the true lesion significance and, and which are not significant? That's important. So knowing physiologic data and using physiologic data is of paramount importance. Um, so what do we know from STEMIs? Well, we do know, we do know that multivessel disease occurs in 40 to 60% of patients with STEMIs and in larger number in uh, cardiogenic shock. And I'm not gonna discuss culprit shock uh, in, in, this, uh, in this talk. It confers higher risks of death, thrombosis, uh, and development of shock. Multiple culprits could be present um, due to systemic inflammatory state. And treatment of non culprit vessels historically have not felt, has not, it has not felt to be beneficial. 
question is, are they beneficial? And I'm going to discuss the latest data, uh, including a, um, a uh, multivariate analysis that just came out last week in, in, in Jack. So if you look at the extent, location, and significance of coronary disease, people who have non-infarct-related disease have increased mortality versus people who don't have infarct-related disease. That's well known. We also know that patients with triple vessel disease, it confers an in independent predictor of one-year mortality versus double versus single vessel disease. And so this is from the Cadillac trial. So we know that if you have more than just the infarct-related artery, your chance of having uh, downstream either mortality or MACE rates are, are significantly higher in, in patients. And so if you extrapolate from our data with complete versus incomplete revascularization, and where we learned from our surgical colleagues who always expressed the need for complete revascularization, the, the premise came up, well, what should we, we, should we be doing non-culprit vessels? And historically, we've always said, well, every PCI increases the risk of, 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 of a problem. Longer, more complex procedures, increased uh, contrast nephropathy, hemodynamic instability, additional procedure time, radiation, exposure, cost. Uh, if you have to do the right coronary, non-infarct related when you have a circumflex infarct, changing catheters uh, and increasing time. And what I said earlier was the non-culprit lesion severity is off, often exaggerated. It's FFR negative in about 40% of patients. And follow-up angios show that 20% of what we call significant lesions are now historically less than 50%. So that's important. And so my rule is really to keep it simple. Uh, and, and, and so here's a scenario that I, I'll present. This we did last, I think last week or the week before. Uh, gentleman comes in with a, uh, a circumflex acute myocardial infarction, uh, which, is, which is clearly uh, thrombotic in nature, uh, what, what Dr. Mirage called a grade five thrombus burden which we did not extract, by the way, just FYI. Uh, he's got a sort of a, an LED lesion, and then no one would argue, I'm not sure why this is not running. No one would not argue that, not to, uh, that the right is not significant. So he's got a circ infarct, a right coronary artery that is uh, angiographically very significant. And most on this panel and probably on attendees would say this is physiologic, it's most likely physiologically significant. And then you have an LED, which is questionable. I can't tell you it's physiologically significant yet. So what would I do in this situation? You know, you fix a circ, but now what do you do next? So we'll talk about that. What are my options? Well, I could do nothing and see how he does. I could do a non-invasive test as an outpatient. And if he shows evidence of ischemia, I could then fix it. Bring him back anyway, either immediately or one to three months later. Do it right away or do it pre-discharge? And the question is, what is the right answer? Um, and of course, using physiologic or, or imaging te technology, which Prashant will talk about in, in the next talk. But what if it was a proximal 90% lesion? Would you, be, would you be more apt to doing it in the morning? I mean, sorry, the same, at, at the time of the procedure or the next day prior to discharge? That, that is truly the question. Um, so, what should we do? Well, yielding to common sense is of paramount importance. And the question I have is, I've always had is, do we have enough evidence to treat multivessel disease in STEMI patients? Well, i.e. complete revascularization. And if you look at the original data from PRAMI, well, PRAMI compared revascularization based on angiographic data. And if you had a second lesion that was 50% or more, not necessarily physiologically significant, uh, they recommended either fixing it or treating it medically. Of course, culprit uh, looked at several different scenarios. And then recently, FFR use with uh, Dynami, Promulti, and, and Compare Acute uh, was assessed. And then Sh Shamir Mishra, Meta, sorry, Shamir Meta recently did, came out with a complete uh, st study, which uh, in, published in November in, in the ACC, in, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so, if you look at the PRAMI data, the, the incidence of cardiac death, non-fatal MI, or refractory angina 
was significantly lower in, in complete revascularization versus non-complete revascularization with a risk reduction of about 65%. If you took out refractory angina and just looked at death and non-fatal MI, doing preventive PCI still resulted in about 64% risk reduction in, in event rates with death and, and non-fatal MI. And obviously, all these studies are not powered for, uh, to assess death, so they're really powered for, uh, and they're mostly due to non-fatal myocardial in, in, infarctions. And all these MIs were spontaneous. Uh, periprocedural MIs were, were, not, were not counted. And, and PRAMI showed early benefit uh, of event rates with uh, preventive PCI, but it has limited applicability because we do not treat 50% lesions or ignore tight lesions. And so, uh, or what we consider tight lesions. So PRAMI was sort of dated right when it came out. But PRAMI and Culprit, which uh, also looked at outcomes with MACE and, sh and showed that complete revascularization was better uh, and led to the changes in our, in our uh, guidelines, also is not really real world data. And so uh, Culprit looked at immediate versus staged PCI. And they showed that if you did it prior to discharge, the patients uh, did equivalently better. So the reality is that the initial data looked at complete revascularization as a positive means. And, and the, the thought process that we had when I was early in my training was the fact that you don't want to touch non-infarct related arteries, the fact that you're increasing contrast load, the fact that you're increasing procedure time, uh, and the fact that you're increasing risk of uh, thrombosis by doing multivessels was really not borne out. But real life cardiology has an, unfortunately looked at the oculostatic reflex, looking at the lesion uh, and in terms of uh, severity as opposed to physiologic uh, significance. And Mishra came out with this, the complete data uh, which, which if you look at, you looked at STEMI versus uh, with multivessel disease and successful PCI in the culprit lesions. And then they looked at complete revascularization in about 2000 patients and culprit lesion only revascularization in about 2000 patients. And they followed up these patients for three years with really uh, GDMT with aspirin and a, a PGY-12 inhibitor and aggressive statins and you know the classic risk factor modifications. And what they showed, which came out uh, in November of last year, which was a, a, a really one of the largest studies on this topic, they showed that cardiovascular death or new MIs were, were much better, was, was significantly improved with uh, complete revascularization. And if you looked at, uh, uh, if you added cardiovascular death MI, and uh, a revascularization, it was still uh, better in these patients. So compared to culprit lesion only PCI, a strategy of non-culprit lesion PCI with the goal of complete revascularization, either early during the hospitalization or after discharge within uh, three to four weeks confers similar benefits to these patients. And the benefit of complete revascularization was shown with death or MI over the long term, after 45 days, there was really no statistically significant differences in outcomes between uh, uh, randomly allocated therapies in either the index hospitalization or after discharge non culprit PCI group. So that, that, that is important to know. And you know that our, our guidelines have evolved after culprit and PRAMI came out uh, in, in, in 2015. And so STEMI has been upgraded and modified to really a class to be recommended to include consideration of multivessel PCI in the right common sense scenario. Um, and if you look at the recent uh, uh, multi-analysis that just came out last week, it, it, has, it does favor multivessel PCI in, in, in the studies. Varanasiri, from um, uh, Nebraska, uh, just published this in, uh, on, on July 13th, looking at uh, 
really looking at primary efficacy outcomes, looking at all cause mortality, reinfarction, and, and showed really, and again, it's a multivariate analysis and it is retrospective and it's looking at all the different studies, but did show that uh, if you look at cardiovascular mortality and repeat revascularization, it does favor multivessel uh, angioplasty and treatment of a non-infarct related vessel. So what do I do? Well, I absolutely do consider if the EKG symptoms, hemodynamics don't settle, if it's angiographically tight, where there's no uh, question that it's significant, I do it there or during the hospitalization. I have a very low threshold for doing FFR or IFR in these patients. Uh, and if, if, it, if it looks angiographically significant to me, I, I rarely send the patient out and do a non-invasive test. So in my patient, for example, is this working? The, uh, I did an LAD IFR on that. After I fixed the right, I did an LAD IFR and uh, it, was, it was not significant. At, it was not significant with an IFR of 0.91 and so I left it alone. But I think, you know, a lot of my colleagues would probably would have fixed that. Um, and so I, I left that alone, fixed the right, and sent the patient home, and he's, he's doing, doing well. So what is my STEMI approach? Well, if, it's, if, it's no, if it doesn't have multivalent disease, well, we're done. If they do, are they in shock? Well, and, and I'm not going to discuss culprit uh, shock here. If they're not in shock and it's uncomplicated, uh, if it's, if it's not uncomplicated, I hold off and I stage it, for example, if they have renal disease or something else. If it is uncomplicated, then I, I'm very inclined to use FFR. I, you know, when I trained in, in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, you know, we didn't have FFR. So we used angiographic oculus synodic data. But I, learning from my younger colleagues, uh, I think IFR, FFR is of paramount importance in, in uh, really assessing what is truly non-infarct and whether it's significant or not significant. And so I am a, a strong believer in FFR guided PCI for intermediate lesions. Uh, obviously if it's very significant, then I am, I am going to fix it immediately. So our goal is to improve survival in event rates, but we need to treat the patient and the lesion. And, and that's important. So to me, we sort of, I find a happy medium between multivessel PCI versus culprit only PCI. And I think the correct plan is probably to meet in the middle. Looking at the patient, you know, these studies have not really looked at octogenarians who come in with acute MIs or, or really specific subgroups of patients. Uh, what about the patient with renal disease, uh, other diseases, uh, other comorbidities, so uh, diabetics. So the correct plan is probably to meet in the middle between multivessel PCI and culprit only uh, PCI. So I know I'm running out of time, but common sense approach to lesions and patient care. And uh, one can achieve all the degrees that the world has to offer and still lack common sense. For all the degrees in the world are no substitute for common sense. So when you do these cases, use your common sense and, and do the right thing for the patient. Thank you very much. Excellent. Brilliant talk. And we'll take question and answer at the end. I invite now next speaker, Dr. Prashant Call. He's a director of Cat Lab at Piedmont Heart Institute, Atlanta, America. And he will enlighten us on uh, imaging, intravascular imaging in ACS, when and why. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, or good evening for you, all of you in uh, India and Asia. Uh, Dr. Bang, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah, of course. We can okay, see your slide, good. we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, and uh, great to be together with Miraj, Rajiv, and Ramesh once again. Um, hope everyone is staying safe. So in the next 10 or 15 minutes or so, I'd like to discuss with you um, the uh, ideas, thoughts, and, and um, data on intravascular imaging 
uh, not only in acute coronary syndromes, but in, uh, in PCI in general, uh, when and why. So here are my uh, disclosures, uh, none too relevant to this discussion. So let me just start by asking you all just some uh, questions, and we can maybe think about this in the discussion afterwards. But, uh, you know, I often sort of ask... Participant, participants can reply in the chat. Yeah, you, we can, um, uh, you can uh, sort of think about these questions uh, and we can discuss further. But I'm just trying to understand in what proportion of your PCI cases do you use in imaging, intracoronary imaging? Do you never use it? Is it less than 5%? Is it less than 10%? Um, so let's, uh, let's have you think about that a little bit. And then if you do, if you are using imaging, what kind of modalities are you using? Are you using IVUS, are you using optical coherence tomography, or are you using both? Um, and if, if you're not using imaging routinely, so if you're using it in less than 10% of cases, why is that? Is that because you feel that there are no data that support the use of imaging? Is it because you think that it takes too long? Um, is it because uh, there are cost constraints and you feel that um, it's uh, too expensive and maybe not cost effective? Maybe it's not available in your lab. Uh, and also we hear often that, uh, uh, you know, we don't really understand how to interpret the images. And so that may be another reason why people are put off. But these are just some questions for thought. But I'll tell you, uh, universally, um, almost across the world, um, and especially in the United States, uh, the use of intracoronary imaging is woefully low. These are some data that we had collected uh, a few years ago. Uh, and um, we basically found that the use of intravascular uh, imaging was somewhere less than 5% across the board. And if you broke that down into where it was used, sort of teaching hospitals versus non-teaching hospitals, uh, the more academic hospitals certainly uh, were using uh, IVUS and OCT much more commonly than the non-teaching hospitals. But so do we have data to support the use of imaging in, uh, in uh, PCI? So here is the uh, IVUS XBL randomized clinical trial. Uh, this randomized 1,400 patients to either IVUS-guided PCI or angiography-guided PCI with a primary endpoint, uh, uh, which was a composite uh, MACE score of cardiac death, target lesion, myocardial infarction, or target lesion revascularization at one year. And you can see here that there was a significant reduction in this primary endpoint in the IVUS-guided group. So 2.9% only in the IVUS guided group compared to 5.8% in the angiography guided uh, alone guided group. Well, what about other trials? Are there other trials? Well, in fact, there are a number of trials. And in fact, here is a meta-analysis of seven randomized controlled trials over 3,000 patients, uh, including long lesions. And again, the data certainly favored IVUS guidance. And IVUS-guided PCI in this meta-analysis was associated with significantly larger post-intervention minimal luminal diameter. It was associated with a greater reduction in the diameter stenosis, uh, also a reduction in the risk of MACE, and there was a borderline lower risk of stent thrombosis and cardiovascular mortality. So um, here is even more data. This is um, not a randomized trial, but this is a very large prospective multi-center all-comers study which included acute coronary syndromes, over 8,500 consecutive patients in both the US and Germany. And uh, they conducted a propensity adjusted multivariable analysis looking at the impact of IVUS guidance on two year outcomes. And this is from two year follow up data from the ADAPT DES study. And you can see looking at MACE, definite or probable stent thrombosis, MI, target lesion revascularization, all at two years. For all of these clinical endpoints, IVUS guidance was statistically superior uh, to angiographic guidance alone. So more recently, we have data from the ultimate trial, which was initially presented a couple of years ago at the TCT meeting and simultaneously published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. And 
This was again an all comer study, which included acute coronary syndrome patients and randomized patients one-to-one -to, -one to either getting IVIS guidance or angiography guidance for uh, PCI with a primary endpoint of target vessel failure at 12 months. And it was powered for superiority. And looking at the primary endpoint of target vessel failure at 12 months, again, significant, statistically significant reduction in this primary endpoint with the IVIS guided group, 2.9% uh, only in the IVIS guided group compared to 5.4% in the angio guided group. So when should we be using, so that covers the why we should be using intravascular imaging. And I hope I've presented a fairly robust data showing you the benefits of using it, but, but how and when should we be using this? So. Uh, you could make a strong argument to use intravascular imaging as a pre-intervention assessment during uh, lesion deployment, uh, during stent deployment, lesion preparation, and also to assess post-procedural uh, complications and assess the stent. So specifically, uh, you are interested in understanding the severity of the plaque and vessel sizing. Is there calcific plaque? Is there any spontaneous dissection? And these are all uh, important to understand as you uh, pick your stent sizes and understand what therapies are needed. Do I need atherectomy? Do I not? Should I not use atherectomy because there's a dissection? And then uh, during and post PCI, uh, how much uh, malapposition or under expansion is there? Do I see any tissue prolapse? Is there edge dissection? These are all. Uh, these are all things that you will not be able to understand unless you use intracoronary imaging. And so uh, there is a, a nice review that I would uh, point you towards in the European Heart Journal, looking at the uh, a sort of a proposed treatment algorithm using intravascular imaging for ACS in particular. And so for ACS patients, why might you need intracoronary imaging? So after your initial angiograms, you know, things like understanding the culprit lesion, is the uh, anatomy ambiguous? Is, it, is the culprit lesion unclear? Do I need to use atherectomy? Is there any associated dissection? These are all some of the uh, imaging uh, reasons, uh, as it were, that will uh, that you will be able to elucidate when you use imaging in the setting of acute coronary syndrome. So not only to further characterize the lesion, but to guide your intervention. Very important. The problem, unfortunately, is uh, many of the guidelines have lagged far behind the uh, available randomized control data. So. For example, here in the United States, our uh, PCI guidelines are, are in the process, in fact, of being updated. We don't have that document available to us yet. Uh, but the most recent guidelines we have are, in fact, from 2011. There has been a lot of data that we have uh, seen now since then over the last nine or 10 years. And so, unfortunately, the use of intracoronary imaging is still uh, at a class 2A recommendation, unfortunately. And personally, I feel that this has been a hindrance to more wide-scale adoption uh, of uh, intracoronary, uh, intracoronary imaging. And um, so let's see, uh, let's move on here. So in the European guidelines as well are in a similar spot and have not updated uh, their guidelines as much either. So to try and kind of put all of this together and um, put this all into perspective, let's end with an interesting case that I would like to um, uh, sort of uh, present to you here. So this is a 58-year-old man uh, who is, um, has the usual risk factors. He's a smoker, he's hypertensive, uh, and he presented to the emergency room with typical anginal symptoms, found to have a troponin of 2.3, uh, there were EKG showed non-specific STT wave changes, and he was referred for diagnostic angiography. So here is the initial angiogram, and you can see there's uh, what appears to be um, some type of lesion in the um, in the mid uh, right coronary artery, 
And uh, he, before I go on, actually, let me sort of pause for a moment and just ask my fellow panelists, what, what do you guys think here? So you have a, and I'll tell you that the left system is normal. Uh, what would you guys think about this? Um, Ramesh, Perez, Rajiv, Vijay, any of you? I think uh, Prashant, to me, it looks like a borderline lesion and a uh, very short, uh, discrete borderline lesion. I would uh, not, uh, you know, at, at the moment I would do FFR and decide whether do we need anything further to be done for this particular block. Correct, yeah. Yeah, that's a great option. Any other thoughts? No, I, I agree. agree. There's, there's, a pretty, there's a pretty decent, it's actually, a, the focal lesion is probably the tightest, but there's a long segment of mild to moderate disease in that entire right from the prox RV marginal branch all the way down probably to 23, 20 to 30 millimeters prior to the distal bifurcation. So that could all be significant. Yeah, I'm sure it, it's a physiologically significant lesion. And I'm sure if you ibis this, you would see a lot of plaque burden. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Not physiologically. So, not physiologically. Oh, 100% physiologically. I'm sure it would be positive. Yeah, so great, all great points. And so um, let me uh, show you what happened next here. So uh, the this was, again, this was done at an outside hospital. So this operator did do FFR. And uh, the FFR of this lesion was 0.65. Okay, so, you know, uh, in keeping with what everyone's saying, like, you know, maybe it appears to be a little bit of a borderline lesion. Uh, you know, he did present with a non-STEMI, reasonable um, uh, uh, option next to um, FFR. So let me ask you guys, then what are you going to do next? Now that you have this uh, abnormal so, FFR. Uh, just, just one point that I feel why it came positive, because the lesion appears to be a long one. Has it been a yes. discrete lesion, then it may not have come positive. But it's a yes, diffuse plaque. It is diffuse plaque from mid RCA to down below, almost uh, you can say about thirty millimeter. And and I'm sure if you just stented this thing right now, a lot of people would probably use a two five stent, and I'm sure it's at least a three or or larger vessel size. Interesting comment, Ruji. Very interesting comment. And um, the right uh, corner is always undersized. I mean, what, what is your take, Prashant, on it is said from earlier times that whenever we do IWAS, we overestimate the size of the vessel? Yeah, I mean, I think that that gets into the nuts and bolts of uh, IVAS versus OCT vessel sizing, whether you use lumen to lumen area versus external elastic lamina area. Uh, and so if you are using luminal size by IVAS, yes, you might overestimate a little bit uh, and underestimate if you're using OCT. Particularly, particularly if you're using 40 megahertz machine. Yes, so there is, there is a, yes, yeah. So you, it's important to sort of bear that in mind. But I think, I think that's, your, your point is actually completely valid. Uh, but I think that gets into the more sort of uh, fine details of imaging, which is important. But I'm trying to make a, a, a sort of a bird's eye view case, firstly, of, of getting people to use imaging. So the point I'm making here is as follows, and Rajiv's point um, is, uh, is, uh, is a very important one. So uh, this was a positive FFR. So the next step was that a 2.5 by 12 millimeter stent was used here to treat this lesion. This is what happened. And here is the final result. So what do people think here? Is this, uh, you, you think this is a decent result? It looks angiographically, it looks a satisfactory result. Nice Timmy 3 flow. Uh, looks like the stent has been uh, reasonably expanded and uh, a nice result here. What would you guys think? So, uh, you, do you agree? This is the whole point. It's angiographically, it looks, it looks pretty decent angiographically, yeah. however. We all know that my, my, my personal rule of thumb is that whatever size you think this looks, it looks at least a half a millimeter larger than, than it is, you know, when you when you image it. So uh, this is one, if you can, image it, you'll probably, can, see a, can, you'll probably see a stent that's probably not exactly where it should be. Can, can we have Ramesh also? Ramesh, where are you? Ramesh? He's, he's on call, so you may have to, have, may have to go. Yeah, yeah, I'm right here. Yeah, yeah, okay. 
I have to. Sorry, someone called. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, You're very scary right now. Mm. Okay, so that so let me show you how this played out. So the, here we are. So this is the pre and post, two point five by twelve millimeter DES, nice angiographic result. This was in March twenty sixteen. Eight months later, just eight months later, in November twenty sixteen, in the same year, the patient now presents again with repeat symptoms and now the troponin is even higher it's now it's five on this presentation and here is now the angiogram okay this is just in eight months so now he's at our hospital so we kind of look through it and, and try and understand what happened here and the first thing that we did after we wired this lesion was to image the vessel okay and as you can see here, the stent is woefully undersized in what is a 4.0 vessel. So if you look at this, this is a 2.5 millimeter stent in a almost 4.0 vessel. Okay. Now there is nobody I would submit um, that angiographically would be able to predict uh, apart from obviously the experience, and of course, Rajiv made a very uh, valid point and, uh, you know, effectively uh, foretold that this is exactly what would happen. But otherwise, angiographically, the point I'm making is very difficult to determine the actual vessel sizing, especially in acute coronary syndromes, because it's especially in STEMIs to that uh, point too, because the vessels tend to be much more vasoconstricted. So routinely, especially in right coronaries, you're always going to undersize the vessel. And no one and so, I would have used a 4.0 vessel. I mean, no one. I, I don't think anyone I could think of at the highest level yeah. without, without, without I mean, the, Nobody. Problem. Exactly the point. Nobody would use a straight Even up that. No one would use a 4.0 stent in that vessel without imaging it because it doesn't look like a 4.0 vessel. So then, basically... We then re-ballooned the, 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 the instant restenosis and re-stented with a 4.0 by 20 stent, uh, obviously optimized by IVUS since now we're going down that road. But the point, the other point here to make is that now angiographically, they both look very similar still. And if you don't image, so these are the two pictures side by side. On the left, and these, the same segment, the same vessel, the same patient. On the left is a 2.5 millimeter stent on the right is a 4.0 stent, okay? And unless you t do intracoronary imaging, there is no way to know what you're dealing with, okay? And so I would submit to you that, the, uh, that because of cases like this, you should have a very low threshold for intracoronary imaging. I think this so is also a good, this is a good example, Prashant, sorry to interrupt, this is a good example. No, go ahead. To, no. Good example to say that, you know, many people would say this is stent failure. You know, this is failure of the drug, failure of the stent, failure of drug eluding stents, but this is actually probably not stent failure. And, and with respect to our profession is probably interventional cardiologist failure, you know, and right. I think this is what we need to do a better job of if we really want better outcomes for our patients. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So then let me, these are my last few slides. Let me just sort of summarize the sort of take home points now. So when should you be using intracoronary imaging? Personally, for me, I have now adopted a, a over 95% strategy. And so in over 95% of my cases, I use intracoronary imaging. Uh, Prashant, uh, can I ask uh, you, which machine do you use yeah. for IVAS? 60 megahertz, is it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and uh, we use both IVUS and OCT, uh, and we have the Philips Volcano uh, IVUS system. So when should you be using intracoronary imaging? Well, in my opinion, I think you should be doing it when there is a large territory at risk, if the stent were to fail, or in scenarios that might be associated with a high risk of stent failure, um, and uh, in all acute coronary syndrome. So looking at patient factors that you, you should certainly have a very low threshold, patients who are diabetic, end-stage renal disease, acute coronary syndromes. We used to say any, if, if, if you are needing to use a bare metal stent for whatever reason, then in those cases, especially because stent failure is high, you should certainly be using it. I've crossed that off here because 
personally, I think there's no real role for bare metal stents anymore. So that that is a moot point. I don't think there's any situation where you should use a bare metal stent. And then certainly anatomical and procedural factors. So any aorto osteal lesions, left main disease, certainly bifurcation stenting, uh, absolutely where you have a prior stent failure, like exactly in the case that I've shown, where you're trying to determine the mechanism of the stent failure. Was it stent failure or was it actually an iatrogenic issue as we have decided here? And certainly all long lesions and particularly when you're understanding calcium. So the decision to use atherectomy or should not, or not to use atherectomy, uh, need not be a guess. There's always this sort of, oh, should I, should I uh, do atherectomy or should I not? There's no need to guess. Just use imaging and understand the burden and extent of calcium. If there's more than 180 to 270 degrees of calcium, then you have your answer. And certainly with uh, calcified lesions also to optimize stents. In ACS in particular, since the topic of, of this um, session is ACS, specifically imaging can help you to detect thrombus. And this may help facilitate identification of a culprit lesion if it's not necessarily obvious just by the angiography. Uh, OCT may be a little better than IVUS in this regard. Very important, as I've just mentioned, for understanding uh, plaque etiology to guide and tailor therapy. Uh, and then, um, as I've said, in non-STEMI patients, when the culprit re uh, lesion may not be angiographically evident. Uh, and I'll make a, a brief point about SCAD, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. In, in cases where you're suspecting it, there may, there may be a role for using imaging. But I caution you when you're using uh, imaging for um, coronary artery dissection, because putting a wire or instrumenting the artery with a uh, dissection can make things much worse. And especially with OCT, if now you've got to inject a bolus of contrast, you can certainly propagate the dissection and make things a lot worse. So only reserve imaging in SCAD if um, there is some clinical or hemodynamic instability, or if you're not sure what's happening, if the angiography is not clear and you need to make the diagnosis, then consider it in, in that situation. And certainly there's been a discussion uh, of uh, this uh, syndrome, such as Minoka, uh, MI with no obstructive coronary arteries uh, to further characterize the vessels. So in summary, this is my last slide, I'll say that we have now significant randomized controlled trial data supporting imaging guidance for PCI in all comers. I do uh, accept that there are several barriers to adoption worldwide, whether that may be cost, whether that may be time, uh, but at the end of the day, we're all here to take care of the patient and to give our patients the best possible uh, PCI outcomes. And so I think it's the onus is on us to, do, to perfect PCI outcomes as much as possible. And I think imaging is very, very important to do that. Um, and please have a low threshold for imaging in the scenarios that I've uh, just described for um, PCI guidance and optimization. And hopefully the case that I've shown you will be a cautionary tale uh, and um, encourage you to use imaging uh, more routinely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Prashant Kual. Very nice talk, excellent case example that you showed. Uh, how imaging has made the difference in selecting the size of the stent. Um, I think it's very important also, good... Vijay, yeah, sure. to, to mention that when you have table side ultrasound, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to a standalone machine, it makes a big difference. I mean, when we had just a standalone machine a few years ago, it was cumbersome to do IVIS. Now that we have table side, it takes literally takes two minutes mm -hmm. to get really informative data. Where I was professor head of cardiology at JJ Hospital, we had an IVAS machine integrated in the cath lab. So all we have to do is just pull out the catheter plug-in and you are on for the IVAS study. I would so, say that's one of the most common reasons of uh, certainly for lack of adoption or, or low adoption is the integration piece. That's a very important thing. And I think it also speaks to the issue of cost. Uh, you know, interestingly, in places in, in um, uh, East Asia, so Japan and other uh, uh, Asian countries, uh, the use of uh, intracoronary imaging is, is almost 100%. But that's because their whole reimbursement structure for uh, intravascular imaging is very different. 
And so that I think has also uh, been an issue. And I, I would propose, I have proposed to some of our societies that not only should there be some reimbursement, but uh, there sh it should be a quality metric. Intravascular imaging should be listed as a quality metric and we should be held accountable to those metrics. Okay, recently there was a paper presented and data presented of long-term uh, follow-up, uh, particularly for optimization in group of patient randomized control trial. Well, group of patient optimized by intravascular imaging and group with our only angiographic guided uh, optimization. And uh, both studies have shown no difference in outcome. No difference in outcome. And it's a large study presented in PCR, absolutely no difference in outcome. Mass rate and death identical. Because these days what has happened, we, we deploy the strength and post deployment, we optimize it with the ANSI balloon at a higher pressure, maybe 0 0.25 bigger size balloon. That has, I think, changed the scenario uh, quite a lot. Almost optimization is now a regular practice. Each one of us after deploying the stand, we optimize it with ANSI balloon invariably, whether we do imaging or not to do it and not done the image. That is one thing. Second, my question is, when you have a STEMI, suppose if you have a STEMI and if you want to you know, assess the size of the vessel using intravascular imaging, for that matter, you have to use IVAS. So suppose you have a 60, 60 megahertz IVAS machine with core registration. It gives a fantastic picture, 3D pictures. So that optimization, you can see like a tube, you know, going that looks very good particularly OCT images where OCT has a very good uh, a very good resolution and pictures looks very beautiful but in IVAS if you do IVAS in a patient with a STEMI you are tend to undersize the vessel the reason being the thrombus adhering to the wall of the vessel and you can you know end up or you can even propagate the thrombus distally and may end up having a slow flow what is your take on this? Yeah, you know the issue of um, uh, the issue of imaging in ACS, uh, I think, is independent of the possibility that you may have distal embolization uh, with uh, you know a post dilation or, or or so on. So I don't think that your you know, in the scenario that you just described that, you know, you're saying that there may be some distal embolization. I don't think that's because of imaging. I think yes. that's more because even if you didn't image and you were just post dilating, it's likely that you would have still seen that. But I think it, the important messaging needs to still be that imaging is essential. Yes. Uh, so regardless of, you know, if you're oversizing by using IVUS, then it's possible that your interpretation of IVUS needs to be tweaked a little bit or recalibrated. Mm -hmm. Like you, your, and I don't mean machine recalibration, I mean the operator needs to recalibrate how they interpret the IVUS imaging. Because, because OCT and IVUS, and I'm not uh -huh. here to promote one or the other, whichever, this, take your pick, use one, sir, but uh, use something. This, uh, the, what I told use you is something. a Japanese study. Japanese study. Japanese yes. have reported that if you do a IVAS in a mm. patient who's stay me just for sizing purpose, you tend to underestimate the size vessel. This is Japanese study. A right. large number of patients. Right, right. Because Japanese, they, as you said, that 95% or more, they almost 100% they do uh, the Correct. imaging. So Correct. Th that is the and in those cases, you you know, in a STEMI setup, you cannot do, obviously, the OCT because OCT will require a large amount of dye and then catheter going forward and then coming back uh, with the force and dye has to be injected with the force. So it may not be suitable to use uh, particularly the OCT. I was, I think it should, it should be okay, but uh, provided you have cleared the vessel from the thrombus by at least giving some intracoronary light, inter lytics or something, intrathrombic. We have a great experience with uh, 
intrathombic intracoronary lighting using uh, you know oxford balloon uh, we you know inflate the balloon make smaller hole and make it like a perfusion balloon and give the drug directly inflate the drug into the thrombus in short time you will see thrombus disappearing there are people who have directly injected in the coronary uh, the uh, lytex half dose and it works very well uh, only thing lytex we cannot use if patient has received a lytex for some reason before coming to pci center outside within 24 hours we cannot use the lytex but after 24 hours half dose lytex uh, it is allowed to use because half life of the lytex is a shorter am i right or wrong what is your take on this yeah, so uh, in general, we we very rarely use uh, intracoronary lytics. We we don't we practically have never used it, or or, or very rare that we give it. Um, and we also don't use uh, intracoronary two B three A agents either. In general, uh, you know, in in the case of a you know patient with very large thrombus burden. Um, you know, similar to maybe not as as extreme as uh, uh, Pervez sort of de was demonstrating, but uh, if there is a heavy thrombus burden or a suboptimal angiographic result, we would rather uh, just put the patient on a two B three A intravenous for twelve to eighteen hours um, uh, or longer, bring back. Bring and then bring back. back, and then bring back. So we we long. have yes. Yeah, so that's typically been our uh, personal approach here. Uh, but we, in general, have resisted the temptation of giving uh, lytics uh, just because the, the, I think the bleeding risk and the data, you know, the risk benefit we don't feel is in favor. Um, but we certainly, you know, to your earlier point, we have certainly used OCT in, in STEMI um, cases. Um, and it's been very helpful um, to understand clearly the, you know, you get some beautiful images of the ruptured plaque and thrombus and so on. But of course, that is, you know, after you've done an initial balloon inflation and you've reestablished Timmy 3 flow and so on. Uh, Pervez, let me ask you, so what is your sort of uh, thought about using um, imaging in um, ACS patients or STEMI patients? Do you do it routinely? Like, what is your sort of um, uh, MO? So no, we do. We uh, we will typically use imaging. Uh, not everybody, of course, but uh, many of us who 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 do STEMIs will do imaging. Uh, it depends. Some some operators will do imaging at the at the start. You know, after rest restoration of flow to size their stent. Some will do it to optimize their stent uh, mm. post PCI. Um, I think they're you know, I, I think that they're with Dr. Bung's point, and I think the Japanese study is a legitimate you know uh, point of discussion. Uh, in the sense that I think depending on your ability to uh, interpret the image uh, for IVUS uh, and OCT, obviously less so given the STEMI and the, and the risk for distal embolization of thrombus with, with persistent injections, I think, uh, you know, maybe something to be worried about. But, you know, with IVUS, I think your ability to interpret that IVUS image, I think is very important for, for you to appropriately size your vessel. And I think that's where the interpretation of IVUS is very important uh, in, in, this, in that particular aspect. Uh, but, you know, I, I feel like if you, if you realize that during a STEMI that you are typically going to undersize that vessel uh, with angiographic uh, alone uh, strategy, then I think you really need to do some imaging to really appropriately size the vessel. Two, two points. One, you really want to try to avoid post dilatation as much as possible in STEMIs. Obviously, whatever thrombus may be behind the stent, you know, the concept of this cheese grating and distal, further distal embolization of that, of that thrombus is another, is another factor which we don't want to continually to continue to propagate. Uh, you really can't take modern 2.5 stents to like 4.5. Uh, it's, it's really not, a, uh, not an intelligent way of, uh, of, of post dilating because uh, there is the concept of conservation of mass uh, exists. So, you know, there's only so much mass in a 2.5 stent. Uh, so trying to make that stent two millimeters larger than it is, is very difficult to do. Uh, that's another point of uh, that, that people must remember. So you should be in the ballpark uh, of where you need to be. I would ivis the vessel sometimes just even ivising the non-thrombotic segment proximal to the, to the thrombotic se uh, segment or distal to it can help as well. Just give you a rough estimate of what you're dealing with. Uh, and then a, and come and then maybe half size down that, that that stent a little bit and then be able to post dilate at the end after giving you appropriate pharmacotherapy as well. 
it's not as simple, I think, as as uh, as just popping a catheter down and putting a stent in. Uh, I think there is a little bit of experience and interpretation that is necessary uh, in a case-based you know scenario. Um, but it's definitely something to consider if you're putting a two and a half millimeter stent in a proximal vessel of any kind. Uh, it's probably undersized, right? So I think that these are just some simple rules that we all have to realize that no one was born with a two and a half millimeter proximal LED, proximal right or proximal circ. So uh, we all need to realize that, that that's probably not the case. Tavej, uh, coming back to the large thrombus burden, you have a tapas trial, the test trial, mm -hmm. and thromboaspiration, thrombosuction, and like uh, GP2, 3B, GP2, 3, 2A, and 3B, they have all failed in large thrombus part. I'm talking only in large thrombus part. Sure. They all failed by mm -hmm. various randomized control trials. They are unable to control 90% mortality. They are unable to bring down any mortality. So right. all that has gone. So how, how do you deal? Because if you thromba, if you balloon the large thrombus burden, then you're likely to have slow flow, no flow, because it's a red plus white thrombus, it is going to get in, clog the microcirculation. So in a, to prevent microcirculation clogging, like, you know, for any STEMI outside, if a patient reaches a non-STEMI, a non-PCI center, he gets, in any case, lighting. Why he gets lighting? Because there's a red and white thrombus and he doesn't get GP2 or B or 3A. He gets lighting because that will take care of red thrombus also, in addition to taking care of, of white thrombus. So similar text, uh, you know, in India, we tend to use intracoronary lighting into the thrombus, directly injecting into the thrombus, like we do it for peripheral arteries. Sure. So peripheral arteries, ours together, uh, continuous, we give that uh, treatment lighting, Lighting, and then we see the results are good. Particularly, thrombus load is very high in peripheral artery because the size are very big. In carotid, they give these lightics. In intracoronary, intracerebral arteries, they give lighting. So, same way in the coronary, lighting works very well, provided you use half dose of lighting. Like retiplase, if you 10 milligram, 10 unit, if you give in the intrathrombic slowly, it works very well. On the table itself, the thrombus disappears. No slow flow, no reflow phenomenon occurs. I think, right. I think so, I think this is this is a practice. I think that I would say that in the U.S. I think Prashant will agree with with me is that yeah, this is yeah. something that we typically don't do. Uh, don't and, if, and if you look at the and if you look at the literature in this particular space, it's a pretty much data free area, in the sense yeah. that there really is no benefit. There is I don't know of any clinical trial that has shown benefit of the use of intracoronary lytic. We therapy. have we have a single I mean multiple center doing the same thing intracoronary intrathrombic lytic half dose 10 milligram and some 40 50 cases there's no randomized control trial 40 right. cases in, and 50 cases trial is there and that shown great result without uh, having any major uh, major uh, uh, bleeding problem in using right. this uh, patient no, I, I, I think that's... Kipan, what what i would say is that you know that's fantastic if that's happening but i think if that's the case then more people should know and you should publish that data yeah, so it... publish in indian heart journal yeah oh, in yeah yeah i think it's important because we so i think that as, as you said earlier uh the use of pretty much any intracoronary uh, antiplatelet agent at the present time has really not shown benefit, right? Absolutely. And I think including including Cangrelor, uh, really, yeah. which didn't show benefit in in. Didn't That's show why it is not. Benefit. It's not taken up. It's not popular at all in America. Also, Cangrelor Correct. is not taken up. Correct. Another I think thing: that... uh, a physiologic study in STEMI, Prashant. Again, uh, FFR is not reliable in STEMI. So, in yeah, case... so, so that's a good question. It's not reliable in the culprit vessel, but yes. we do have we do have a number of studies that uh, Rajiv alluded to where there is a role in the non-culprit vessel. There is a role in non-culprit vessel, even yes. in uh, acute uh, STEMI stage. In the even in the acute STEMI okay. in the index procedure. Index procedure. Okay. Correct. In the non-culprit, non-culprit. Non-culprit. Culprit, culprit yeah. vessel is of no value. No, I mean, it, it obviously makes no sense to do it there. Absolutely. Absolutely. No value at all. 
So uh, in your practice, when you see a case of uh, not unstable support, how do you uh, go forward to treat the patient? Do you do all those uh, STEMI score, GRACE score to decide high, high risk or only just do troponin? If troponin is positive straight away, uh, invasive strategy. Yeah, typically, uh, you know, the non stemmies that we see, uh, you know, they're triaged up front and, you know, the, the real non stemmies troponin two, three, four or higher, um, you know, invariably, unless there is some reason uh, not to bring them to the cath lab, uh, you know, they the have kidney disease or some other issue or stroke or something like that, almost invariably, those people will come to the cath lab for an invasive assessment at some and point. How many, how many of them you leave it for, uh, you know, medical management and discharge them? The minority and the minority, uh -huh. I would say that there are some patients who fall in an in, in between category where we might think about doing a, a CTA, coronary angi a CT angiogram. CT. And that would and be do a... You, do you find it useful? CT angiogram has, we found it very useful, especially because now, you know, we're combining CT angiogram with CT FFR. CTFFR. And so CTFFR has been very, very helpful, and uh, it allows us to, um, you know, understand specifically, you know, before there was a much higher rate of uh, subsequent follow-up angiograms with the CT, after the CT. But now with the FFR component, you know, many of those cases we're not needing to bring to the lab because we, we're getting uh, good information from the FFR. What is your approach in ectasia? coronary ectasia without any significant block or with the significant block, both the situation. Yeah, I, I mean, any, any coronary ectasia, my first, my first reaction is to, is to step away and, and run away as far as possible, you know, from an interventional standpoint. I mean, I think uh, Ramesh's point was important and well taken, which yeah, is that, um, uh, which is that it's, you, you have to try and minimize any instrumentation and because you know inevitably you're never going to win because there's no scaffold or stent that is going to be large enough and there's no scaffold or stent that is going to stay open without any huge thrombus risk so i think um, the goal should be to try and minimize any uh, instrumentation so often we'll our first thought might be to um uh, to stop and either give uh, uh, lytics or um, IV 2B3A for a couple of days uh, and then just to try and manage them conservatively. So our, our goal is to try conservative management, stabilize the patient, and then try and have a, a heart team discussion with the surgeons to offer the best strategy, uh, which may involve some kind of surgery or, or ligation. Suppose you have a single vessel, a right coronary, pseudo aneurysm, big size, or even if two aneurysm, more than four times of the adjacent vessel. That's when we call it a aneurysm. With a big neck, it is aneurysm, true aneurysm, and small neck, it is pseudo aneurysm. So when we have this aneurysm, there is a study which is reported stent assisted coiling. Means you stent across the aneurysm neck and then inject the coils into the neck so that they don't prop, prop out into the, into the lumen of the main artery. And that seems to be quite good, uh, I mean, reasonably good result in isolated, selected cases. I mean, you need to select Correct. the case. Correct. No, that's actually a good, a good point. There is, uh, there has been dis a described technique. Uh, yes. It does require a little bit of finesse to uh, do that. Finesse and skill, of course. Yeah, of course, because clearly if any of that, uh, you know, the coil material or anything goes down the wrong way, you've now yeah. occluded the vessel that you may not get open again. Uh, but in addition, there are other things that people have tried. Um, and certainly if it's a very narrow neck, uh, there have been cases where I've used a covered stent and uh, certainly with the, you know, we now have uh, the PK papyrus stent available to us, uh, right. which is uh, a much better platform than our previous Jomed stents. Yeah, so, it. you know, we might be more inclined to use that stent in a situation like that. It's again, in, on a case by case situation, assuming the neck and anatomy is favorable 
for a, a, a treatment st strategy like that? Lately, um, lately earlier, for any aneurysm, mycotic aneurysm or any other aneurysm in the coronary artery, big size aneurysm producing symptoms of uh, acute coronary syndrome, those patients are considered and uh, the interesting part is earlier there was only recommendation for bypass surgery for all this single mm. vessel and you have a frequent problem with this bypass surgery but now lately even they are ask, uh, they are reporting that you can put a covered stent across and that also is comparable result because covered stents are now thinner wall they have a better technology in one, the, these, uh, the about uh, the one graft master, it does have a, a pericardial tissue to I mean, cover. So it's it's good result that gives. So what, do you have any experience? You said you have some experience. Yes, I have yes. Some experience. Yeah, we, we've had a, a number of cases. You know, it's interesting that we have seen a few uh coronary uh aneurysms like that and where we've treated with covered stand with some with coiling uh but we've also seen a number of um vein graft aneurysms and that's another sort of situation that's that, that then there are other options there so you know uh there've, there's been cases where we've had very large giant aneurysms in the in the mid body of a vein graft that is supplying a, a CTO vessel, for example, and so we might then decide to open the native CTO and then coil or close the the vein graft. And so we've done yeah, that yeah. Really a number of times. Yeah, one uh, case was shown. This case that you are describing, yes, that was yes. shown by your colleague uh, in, in, no, in ACC. That, that was my that was my case actually. I that showed that was it. your case. He told also that was your case. Yeah, so we did that, and, but in that case, what we did is I put in an Amplatzer plug into the body of the, because it was like the neck of the aneurysm was about 10 millimeters, oh. eight, 10 millimeters. So very but, large. Uh, but the plug holds it? Yes, the plug holds it. And, uh, and we even have six month follow-up data where we did a CT angiogram and uh, the whole graft had occluded uh, nicely and then the uh, native vessel was still was still patent. So, you know, I think the point is that these situations are unusual, uncommon, and there is no generalized one size fits all strategy. No, so no. you have to see, understand that there are a number of different options available to you, right from conservative management uh, to these coils or plug closures right the way through ligation and all of these things. And it's important to have a heart team discussion with your surgeons to then, for your particular patient, to customize the solution for your patient. Good. Now, as I said earlier, the optimization data, no difference at all. Imaging, no imaging. But Illumin 4 trial result will come somewhere in 2021. Yes, that is, that is when uh, perhaps this debate on whether to opt for optimization, imaging, intravascular imaging to be done or not done. Because uh, if there is no outcome benefit, then it's not worth the exercise, particularly for optimization. Imaging will remain for many other reasons. You know, we, I had one patient, very interesting case. Young lady presented with a suddenly sudden cardiac arrest. She was revived on the road and brought to the hospital. So we naturally, after stabilizing her, we did an angio and we found that she's got a, a mid LED, generalized narrowing, almost 20 millimeter long narrowing in the mid LED. So we decided to do, because uh, there was no evidence of plaque anywhere a young lady, 42 years old. So we decided to do a OCT. And OCT revealed that it is intramural hematoma compressing the artery in, in spontaneous, which is fibromuscular dysplasia. We know that it is a fibromuscular dysplasia. So, it's com so we left alone because if we stent it, then it, the intramural hematoma will move down and create a problem. So we didn't stent it, we, we just left it alone. 
Mm-hmm. And we called the patient after one and a half years, two years, and angio was absolutely no. Hmm. Yeah, no, so, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, in some situations, in, in, in another patient, we stented. That was fifty-five years old male patient. So usually, this FMD is very, very well known. Fibromuscular dysplasia is well known in female patient, hmm. usually. particularly after postpartum usually but male we have hardly heard heard of anything in rca you know we saw proximal tight lesion patient classically symptomatic without doing any intravascular imaging we stented the patient hmm. so two points the st- moment we stented the patient the intramural hematoma moved beyond the stent the distal edge of the stent and then there was from timi 3 flow flow has come down to now timi 1 to the distal art so we imaged it to understand what has happened and imaging found intramural hematoma which has moved from here to there so stenting in sometime in intramural hematoma particularly if you have a fmd causing a spontaneous uh, uh, coronary artery dissection is something which is uh, but it it can be life threatening i mean it can just kill the patient if patient develops acute v up because of acute ischemia patient can develop primary v up and die so this is case which i just wanted to discuss with you that how do you decide do you image all those patient who present young with the cardiac arrest or you know for some <laughs> reason particularly female patient postpartum Yeah, it's just on a case by case basis. As I said earlier, you know, uh you have to be very cautious about instrumenting a vessel that's clearly dissected. If it's if it's very obvious on angiography, I don't believe there's any additional benefit to be gained. If you've if you've decided and made the diagnosis that it's a spontaneous coronary artery dissection by angiography and you know you're going to manage conservatively, I don't think imaging adds anything further and may in oh, fact cause without harm. imaging you cannot make my diagnosis because how will you say that there is intramural hematoma without no, that's no that's different i'm saying that if there is own if there is a scenario where the diagnosis is clear if the diagnosis is in doubt like in your case then it may be reasonable cautiously to advance the catheter if you think there may be an associated dissection now the other point i'll make is that we see from time to time especially in the cto's world this intramural hematoma the other thing yeah. that you can do is to take a cutting balloon cutting and yeah. that's what cutting you take balloon, a cutting and, balloon then... and release the hematoma and yes. sometimes in in certain cases the compression in, of the lumen is so significant that you can't manage conservatively Correct. and in many of those cases we will just do a cutting balloon release the hematoma and then allow the vessel to heal and not necessarily treat with stent so that's but, another uh, thing and then my last in point CTO, but in ct yes. you on the table itself you drain the hematoma by you know going into the hemato uh, in the hematoma and drain yeah, you so if you're in the subintimal space and you're doing and you're trying to reenter then yes you may aspirate the hematoma in the subintimal uh-huh. space Very or you, you you there are situations where you might need to use a cutting balloon to release the hematoma but going back to the imaging point and the point you made about illumian 4 you know certainly illumian 4 will add to the uh data that we have uh, and will further solidify you know optimization and so on but i would propose or submit to you that you know we already have over 10 randomized control trials that are already telling us that imaging is better in my mind the the question has already been answered that imaging guided pci is superior to angiography guided pci so for me personally you know although i'm uh, interested curious and excited to see the illumian 4 results Uh, it will only further enhance my sort of imaging and may uh, may give us more insight into how to optimize but it doesn't add anything to i believe the established uh, point that we should be imaging there is now, one dr uh, yadav okay oh. yes yeah go ahead oh, go ahead there is one dr yadav from delhi yes he also asked a question that illumin 3 trial recently presented Mm-hmm. showed no benefit i was oct or angiography guided pci no benefit at all no outcome benefit 
how do you look at this yeah so i'm not, already discussed yeah i'm not sure um uh, you know all of these you know the uh, all of the, there's a lot of data some of which may be discrepant right you you've even suggested that the there was a japanese study that showed no difference see every all of these no, studies I, have, i was saying about element 3 only what i was talking to you about no difference is element 3 Yeah, it's like recently pre- presented in PCR. Right, but all of these all of these trials like I personally think that are effectively superseded by the more pure randomized control trials that are much larger scale, right? So ultimately yeah, the, the largest the trial, randomized control trial at a large scale. A right, but the largest trial. but the largest trial that we have to date is ultimate. And the largest randomized trial that we have to date is ultimate which showed clear benefit. right uh, 2.9% of, of patients in the ivis group had a you know uh, had the primary endpoint versus 5.4 uh, almost 6% in the angiography guided group and so you know i think we it's important we're always looking for for whatever our own individual biases may be we're looking for data to support what our bias might be right so i would propose that like let's first forget let assume cost is no option assume you know and i understand that you know there are limitations and it's okay to say look i you know imaging is the right thing to do i may not be able to do it for reasons x y and z but this is the right thing to do for our patients and uh you know so this should be done so i think the the you'll have one trial here or there that shows otherwise but the preponderance if you if you combine all in a meta analysis if you look at the meta analysis of all the trials it still favors imaging so yeah, based on element, that you know element 3 trial element 3 trial is was also powered very well to conclude whether optimization uh, intravascular imaging optimization versus angiographic optimization or pci guide, guided by intravascular imaging or angiographic guided pci both outcome were identical no outcome benefit therefore uh, this also was power- powered to you know have a practice impact or game changer yeah i mean it but again it's a much smaller trial than the larger trials that we've seen i mean it was only 400 or so patients in each arm so it's a much smaller trial um uh but you know there are certain limitations with the trial too that you know but but regardless i think i think we all are agreed on the on the point of imaging in general and its role and importance so that's i think the messaging that we're trying to sort of promote correct so great uh, having you and we had a very nice uh, cme i'm sure uh, the the case that uh, dr dagobiti showed was a extraordinary left main uh, aneurysm i never seen that uh, you know that patient uh, they again came back with the close uh, left main they tried to wire it and all those things after the bypass surgery very unique case and i've never seen such a case but it was a kawasaki uh, disease causing aneurysm of the left main and rca and Aneur- rca was hugely aneurysmal in the same patient mm. so very unusual cases that we have uh, seen and mm. your case that uh, two smaller stent was deployed and came back that was also a, looked like a stent failure but instead it was a inappropriate size stent i think an excellent discussion we have very nice no very enjoyable i hope the very enjoyable Uh-huh. I hope all the participants um uh-huh. you know all over there, India and wherever else enjoyed it too. There are some questions uh, being asked and uh, let me uh, let me uh, ask you I was in 5 to 10% why so low in western world you you quoted na that almost 5.7% is the intravascular imaging being done in mo- in number of pci that are done yes America. yes 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 no so it's a good question so you i guess the question is asking why is the adoption of uh, intracoronary imaging so low the question is asked here? by dr jagdish sharma yeah no dr sharma very good question 
You know, I think it's a combination of the same uh, the same issues that you may be seeing in India as well. So it's a case of cost. It's a case issue of time. It's an issue of physician education. Uh, many uh, there are many physicians who during their training were not trained to use intracoronary imaging and so are not comfortable with the image interpretation. Uh, and then combined with that, the, as I alluded to in my talk, the other problem is that our societal guidelines have not been updated to reflect the, yeah, the sure newer that. data for imaging. 2011 guidelines last updated were 2011. So now 2011. almost nine years passed by. Correct. And a lot of data has come since then uh, and so on. And then again, so there's no, there's no, um, no one's sort of looking over your shoulder to see, are you doing imaging or not? Right. It's not. I a, think, a I think guidelines are awaiting yeah. element for results. In part, in part, I mean, the, the guidelines are actually being updated current right now. So the, the new guidelines are going to be published even before Illumion 4 are, uh, okay. we see the results. Yeah, okay. Um, but, uh, you but, uh, you the know. Council. ICC yeah. Council. Correct, yeah, so. Um, even Parvej is there on the ICC Council with you. That's right, yes. Yeah, so, uh, you, you know, so, but there are a number of, so I think these are the things that we can do if the question is, uh, the, the initial question is, why is imaging use so low? The, the sort of follow-on question is, what can we do to improve imaging use? And I think there are probably five things. One is, as I've mentioned, to improve phys physician education, improve their interpretation of imaging, update the guidelines, maybe make them quality metrics, and then finally uh, consider improving reimbursement. Absolutely. The only issue with us in India is that most center have only 40 megahertz machine yeah. without any core registration or 3D in the IVAS machine. Mm. So problem is that sometimes you get a great difficulty. Learning curve is a little uh, higher particularly proper interpretation, that is one. Second, <clears throat> many times you can't see clearly EEL because some of the other 40 megahertz, the clarity of picture is not that good to give you clearly the, uh, you know, show you media and you can take a call where the EEL. It's not only that in calcified, calcified artery, you don't see EEL clearly, but in other arteries also, you don't see EEL that clearly. Yes. No, it's not easy. For, for, yeah, I, yeah. It's not easy. OCT is much better at understanding. Much, much, much better. Yes. Yeah. And I don't, I mean, if EEL, I think is a, is a construct that has come from uh, sort of OCT imaging basically. And so I, okay. I, tend, I, I don't sort of try and look for the EEL with IVAS. Yeah. Correct. Uh, correct. Yeah. You just, you take an internal, internal. Luminal, internal luminal area. area yeah. Yeah. That's a, and we, the software gives the details about how much is the percentage of narrowing. Is Correct. All you have to do is just put a grid inside and that's it. The result Correct. automatically comes with the software. Excellent yeah. discussion we have. And great. Thank you very much great, for the invitation. Great talks. Great talk. Nice having you. And uh, your presentation was great. And other, other speakers also have had very great presentation. And we all enjoyed. Thank you very much. If anything, I'll let you know in the future so that we can come together and do this. You know, Corona time, this is the best part, positive part of Corona is that we have this online education. I will yes, you. yes. Thank you very much for organizing thank and thank you for thank the invitation. Thank, thank you thank very you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Great, great. Thank you. Bye-bye.